This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. So without much uh, further ado, I'll begin. Uh, I, I know this is a mixed audience, so I thought I would, you know, in case anybody doesn't know what sequestration is, spend a little bit of time talking about that with th that to begin with. Um, so pretty typically, you know, we have anthropogenic carbon dioxide. This might be produced from, you know, making natural gas and separating out some of the carbon dioxide in the natural gas to bring the natural gas up to pipeline quality. Uh, that actually counts as anthropogenic CO2. Might have carbon dioxide from a power plant or a cement manufacturing plant. Um, and the, the essential idea is if we can then uh, bring that to you know, sites where we can uh, sequester it in the earth, uh, it, can, it can stay in the earth, perhaps do some good for us as well. So if we injected carbon dioxide into a depleted oil and gas reservoir, we might enhance the production. Uh, if we injected it into a coal bed uh, methane or into a coal bed field, we might be able to enhance uh, methane production from that uh, from that coal bed, and that's actually most of what my talk will be focused on today. And uh, there are also possibilities of uh, saline aquifers, so there are aquifers underground that have relatively high concentrations of salt in them. You can't, you know, drink that water. Um, so those also look like potentially uh, very large and very good sites for storing uh, for storing carbon dioxide. So I will, uh, you know, kind of begin here. This is sort of the promise of sequestration. These are uh, a set of sort of different scenarios, if you will. So for carbon emission versus time with some different scenarios. So this is sort of a, uh, um, you know, continuation of a 1990 technology, the red line would be a rather, um, you know, uh, intensive uh, assumptions and advances in fossil fuels, increased or sustained use of nuclear and uh, renewables. And there's this gap between the red line and, and sort of what's projected, uh, the carbon emissions that you would like to have to uh, stabilize atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide concentrations. And, you know, this is where, you know, carbon capture and disposal could come in as one of the technologies to actually let us um, sort of meet uh, emissions targets for uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. So um, a lot of times people will give talks and, and, and talk about some of the various field projects and present this as um, something that's not currently done. I'll give you an example of a true sequestration project uh, that occurs today. Uh, in, in, so this is Wyoming, uh, Idaho, Utah, and uh, Colorado. So there is uh, natural gas production near La Barge, Wyoming. Uh, that natural gas uh, needs to be treated before it can be put in the pipeline. So it has methane, carbon dioxide, helium, and some hydrogen sulfide. Um, so obviously they separate up the natural gas, put it in a pipeline, and sell it. In this particular place, that carbon dioxide is then uh, concentrated and put in a pipeline. It goes from La Barge, Wyoming, uh, a few hundred miles down to Rangeley, Colorado, where it's injected for uh, enhanced oil recovery operations. This is anthropogenic carbon dioxide, uh, even though it's coming from a natural source, because it's coming from gas processing. And this project is driven solely by economics, so it's not a sequestration project in the sense of, uh, of uh, it was mandated, because it, it made economic sense to get a CO2 source this way. Uh, and the um, so again, this is part of the, the promise. And here is sort of what it you know, does down there at Rainsley. So this is uh, oil or gas production in uh, thousands of, well, here's 100,000 barrels per day. So here, uh, injection of CO2 started about 1987, 1986. Uh, this bottom line is a projection of what the oil production would have been from that oil reservoir. The top line is, uh, is actually what did occur. So what's been shaded green is the so-called incremental production, or it's, the, it's the, uh, the enhanced recovery that came from this. And up to, um, 
a few years ago, it's still over 100 million barrels of incremental um, recovery. And you know, if you just want to wrap your head around why this could make sense, if uh, here's 20,000 barrels per day, right? So 20,000 barrels per day at $100 per barrel, it's about $2 million per day sort of gross revenue. So I mean, there, when you have an ant forward recovery operation, you can actually uh, offset um, you know, some of these costs for bringing CO2 on site. Uh, the other thing that comes up a lot is here is the gas that was injected. Here's the gas that's produced from the field. So the CO2 that's produced in this gas stream is actually separated out and re-injected. So if you will, the net sequester is the difference between those, between those two lines. Okay, so the reason I tell you this is because I want to kind of have it both ways in this talk. Um, I want to tell you that, you know, I believe we can go out and do this today because we already do it today. Um, we can find sites, we can drill wells, um, we can complete those wells, we know how to plug and abandon them, we can monitor the CO2 progress. But this is all in sort of an oil and gas, oil and gas setting. Um, and so I want to have it the other way to say yes we can do it, but I think there's some very significant sort of unanswered questions. One argument that a lot of people will say, well why you know, perhaps we don't need to do a lot more research or a lot more thinking about sequestration. They'll say, oh, well, you know, we do this in an oil gas setting, um, you know, so we know how to manage those sub surface flows. It's a solved problem. Um, what you have in oil and gas setting, though, is you have a lot of wells. You have a lot of feedback. You're injecting fluids. You're producing fluids. And you're constantly sort of updating your engineering model. So there's a lot of input. I think in a sequestration process, you know, we want to be sort of more predictive uh, than, than, than we currently are able to do in sort of the oil and gas setting. So, um, so again, you know, this is my opinion, so it's worth it to pay for it. Um, we're really not able to handle some of these very difficult issues, um, you know, that I think will be asked of sequestration. Um, you know, we know that most organic matter that was deposited uh, and then, you know, basically was, was uh, you know, cook into a hydrocarbon is never captured by a trap. Um, you know, there are well-documented oil seeps. There are well-documented leakage from gas caps in the North Sea. Um, so, I mean, those are problems that need to be addressed. Uh, we have a fundamental problem in perhaps that a lot of these flows that we want to do to inject carbon dioxide into a saline aquifer. That is... Uh, a hydrodynamically unstable flow and our ability to both just, you know, just to describe those phenomenologically and to describe those flows um, numerically uh, is not as well advanced as our ability to sort of describe other kind of kinds of flows. Okay. So um, I think that uh, all of the research within GSEP in sort of the, the carbon storage or carbon sequestration area uh, geologically fits into sort of these three areas. Um, you know, there's questions about what are suitable traps for, uh, for storing CO2. So in this in the cartoon, the, the buoyant carbon dioxide is sitting on top of uh, water. Uh, once you've found a trap, you need to be able to make relatively uh, accurate physical predictions about where uh, those fluids will go. So this is like two different scenarios. CO2 is red. Uh, there's a series of uh, layers here that are stacked up. So the CO2 tends to sort of pond beneath these layers as it's trying to rise by buoyancy forces. And if you have discontinuous tails or holes sort of poked into the barriers between these layers, you can see that you get sort of more, uh, more CO2 sort of escaping or migrating upward. And then once it's in place, you know, you, we need tools to be able to go out and, and, and uh, monitor it in place and say, um, you know, yes, it's, it's there, uh, it's not moving, or yes, it's there, it's moving, and this is where it's moving to. Um, it's not necessarily bad that you would have discontinuous shales and things migrating, it's just how long would it take uh, until it's trapped or until it makes it to the surface. So most of my work is in this area, in the fluid migration side, so that's kind of what I'm going to um, focus on. And um, a lot of the work that we've done is very detailed. Uh, on transport, and so I'm going to tell you about that, and I'll do my best to sort of throw out the generalities as we go. Um, 
go. Okay, so I will give you sort of two pictures. Uh, one uh, related to coal beds and another one related to sort of um, and a little more remotely, but related to unstable displacements so as they would apply to, say, uh, injection into, a, uh, into an aquifer. Okay. Um, so why study coal beds? Um, one, coal is just intrinsically uh, interesting when you think about flow because, um, because of the structure of coal and the fact that um, gases tend to absorb some more strongly than others. That will come out as I talk. Um, but but what, one other thing that makes coal sort of very intrinsically interesting, if you look at what people have estimated for the amount of CO2 that you might store in them, the estimates vary widely. So uh, in this IEA estimate, it basically says it's, you know, it's a non-player. In this other estimate, it says it's about 1,000 gigatons of CO2 which is on par with depleted oil and gas reservoirs and sort of the mid-range for aquifers. So, you know, in terms of adding um, some knowledge or some impact, this is a place where, you know, some adding some understanding might help us to make, uh, you know, better choices about whether or not this is a good setting for, uh, for, um, for CO2 storage. Okay. So, um, we think about this in terms of uh, two things. One, we know that there's methane absorbed on coal. Uh, at the moment, about 10% of U.S. natural gas production is actually methane derived from coal. Uh, so if there are ways of actually enhancing methane production from coal by injecting CO2, that, you know, more the better. Then it looks like that EOR project that I began with. Um, and, and there's a real way to sort of offset some costs. So kind of what we've been doing is a combined you know, study, and again, it's very finely detailed, but we want to understand what happens when you introduce carbon dioxide into coal. We understand that from an experimental point of view, and we want to understand that from a, from a, um, a mechanistic or a, 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 you know, a simulation sort of point of view. Okay, so I'll begin here, and this is why, you know, this is some of the reasons why we, well, well why people believe that, uh, you know, these coal beds are, are quite attractive. So we actually have a coal sample that comes from uh, Wyoming. And we've measured the absorption in this nice metric unit of standard cubic feet of gas per ton of coal. Um, uh, but that's just the way it's done. Versus pressure, okay, so for three different gases. So if we look at about 800 PSI, which is about what the in-situ pressure is in, uh, in some of these coal beds, in uh, Wyoming from where this coal comes from. You know, methane has absorption of, you know, somewhere, let's say, 500 standard cubic feet per ton at that pressure. But you could actually load that surface with carbon dioxide to about 1,500 uh, standard cubic feet per ton. So if you want to think about it, you could displace one, meth at least from this data, right? So you could displace one methane molecule and you could put three CO2 molecules kind of back where that methane molecule um, came from. So that's why it looks you know, attractive from a sequestration point of view because you know, if, if this is how you know, a lot of systems behave um, and if you can get the gases inside then you know, not only can you take all the methane out, combust it and put the byproducts back in but you also have then room to spare to put more, uh, more CO2 in. So coals have this sort of selective um, absorption property. So CO2 absorbs quite strongly. Methane um, absorbs uh, quite well and nitrogen absorbs uh, even, even less. So, The other sort of interesting behavior here is that we see um, hysteresis. So if you're increasing pressure, we follow this blue line, but when we go and actually desorb the gas, it follows this red line. Um, and this also, if this behavior is general, um, kind of says that these might be good storage sites because you can imagine um, a scenario where, yes, you go in and you load the surface up, the in-situ pressure is about 1,000 PSI, and then something happens where pressure is released and, say, pressure then decreases to about 600 PSI. Um, the loading on that surface actually hasn't changed much, right? So you don't, haven't lost much carbon dioxide when the, uh, when the pressure decreases. So, I mean, this is some of the reasons why uh, you know, it looks like a nice storage site. Uh, but then, you know, the real question is can you get the carbon dioxide to go into these systems? Can you get the methane to come out? Um, and that's some of the questions that we've been looking at. Okay. Before 
I talk about transport, um, I'll do my best to ex sort of explain um, a couple of ideas. So if so, we what we need to be able to do to describe is how mixtures of gases absorb on the surface. And these are model results based on those data that I showed you. Um, and if you want, this is concentration of carbon dioxide in the adsorbed um, phase of the adsorbed gas versus pressure for two different models for the so-called extended Langmuir model, which is the, in some sense, it's the standard of the state of the art that people use to describe it. And then sort of a delta better model, which stands uh, IS, which stands for ideal absorbed solution. Uh, but what I want you to get out of this is that if you look at the Langmuir, which is, again is sort of the state of the art, um, you see that at this concentration, which is a gas of which is 25% CO2, there's virtually, there is no behavior that goes with pressure, right? So there's no sensitivity that goes with pressure. And I have another slide uh, that's the same, well, that's these two models compared a little bit differently. So sometimes we speak of the selectivity for the surface. So if you have a gas with a higher selectivity for a surface, that means it's going to absorb more strongly. And again, these are for different mixtures of CO2 from basically something that's 25% CO2 up to something that's 85% CO2. All of these extended Langmuir lines are down here on this single curve, on this single line. Okay, so it has no sensitivity for selectivity with, um, with pressure or with composition. This other model, you can see that there is sensitivity with pressure because these, uh, you know, these are evolving and there's also sensitivity with concentration. So this doesn't necessarily mean yet that this is a bad model, but they, that they give different behavior. And that, so we sort of like that we have a model that says, yes, things are sensitive to pressure. Yes, things are sensitive to concentration because those sort of fit our intuition for how these things should be made. Okay, so as we go through, I'll show you some modeling results. And when it says Langmuir, it's one model. And when it says it's IAS, it's a, it's a different model. Uh, and that's sort of the main, the main thing to get out of these two slides. Okay, so what I want to do, just don't worry about the, the differential equation, um, is we're going to look at some experimental results compared to some, uh, uh, compared to some uh, analytical, well, not analytical, to some numerical solutions. And this, we've done different concentrations. Uh, this is an interesting case to look at. This isn't necessarily a good concentration for uh, sequestration, but it's about half carbon dioxide, half nitrogen. If we inject this into a coal pack that's saturated with methane at a pressure that's, uh, again, fairly reasonable for something in the, the Powder River Basin in Wyoming. Uh, there's no water, so it's, it's pretty dry. Okay? And then we monitor what comes out of the system. So we have a, a, an analysis system that tells us at any particular time how much methane, how much CO2, how much nitrogen comes out. Okay? Um, and we put in these two different uh, absorption models into, the, uh, uh, into, this, you know, into this differential equation. We account for the fact that coal has internal porosity. So coal has small pores connected to somewhat larger pores, connected to larger pores. So we account for that. Uh, and we do, and we actually don't treat the gases in an ideal sense, which is what this says. So we actually try to, um, we don't say it's an ideal gas. We actually account for the non ideality of the gas phase. Um, so uh, to begin with, I'll show you pure CO2 injection, right? So the gas analyzer, you know, tells us what's coming out of the function of time. So you have concentration versus time. Okay, and these are in, in non-dimensional units. So if it says one, uh, that basically means that that's the amount of um, gas that you would put that would fill all the little pores in, in the system. So what we see is that CO2 is actually a very good uh, injection gas in this kind of a setting because we basically have pure methane that's produced for some amount of time. Uh, and then the CO2 breaks through. There's a very narrow zone where this mixes and then it goes down. So basically by injecting CO2, you can push out all that methane and you don't actually produce much in sort of a, in sort of a mixed phase, okay? So the, the symbols are the experimental data and then the solid lines are the comparison between these two models and you see that the somewhat more robust IS model, at least in this comparison, seems to do, uh, seems to do a better job, okay? So that's kind of one of the messages that's been coming out of our work is that the state of the art extended Langmuir, which is simple to implement, is not, the, is not perhaps descriptive 
of what happens in these, in these cold bed processes. Okay. Um, here's a more complicated system. So again, this is half CO2, half nitrogen. Um, and again, this is the same comparisons. Uh, first, let me tell you what happens sort of physically. Um, so we have this 50-50 mixture of, more, more or less 50-50 mixture of CO2 and nitrogen that comes in. Okay, so for some period of time, we produce pure methane. The nitrogen breaks through first. Okay, so if you remember that those absorption curves that I showed you that were measured in our lab, nitrogen absorbs very weakly. Um, so in fact, you know, it, it's flowing through the pore space and it doesn't really want to stick, you know, in a volume sense, the, the percentage of the volume that wants to stick down isn't so much. Uh, so in effect, this coal bed, as, this coal pack, has separated the nitrogen from the CO2 because the CO2 breaks through much, much later. So uh, in fact, one of the things that we worry about in sequestration is uh, that, uh, you know, how pure does the CO2 need to be that's delivered to the site? And, you know, to some extent, if you're willing to pay for this, where you have mixed methane and nitrogen production, um, you know, the coal bed can affect some of that separation for you. So that's actually another thing that's coming out of our work, and you'll see this again in a second, is that perhaps pure um, CO2 injection for the coal bed setting isn't probably what you want to do. You want to have some amount of, of nitrogen in the system. Uh, it's not really reflected here, but if we made a plot of, of percent recovery versus time, uh, the nitrogen actually helps too because it, because it moves through relatively quickly. It gives you a, a kick in production faster. Um, and if you're doing something, you know, if you're paying for today's dollars for an injectant, um, you'd actually like to get some economic benefit faster, and the nitrogen actually gets you, lets you do a little bit of that. Okay. And again, um, Comparison of these two absorption models. This IS model does better. We actually get the breakthrough time of CO2 uh, very accurately, so that's a good thing. Um, we don't quite match what happens with uh, the nitrogen. The nitrogen uh, comes out, it peaks, and then it declines to the injection condition because what happens is the nitrogen goes, it moves through the system, it separates from the CO2, so it absorbs, and then the, and then the CO2 comes along behind it and pushes out some of the nitrogen. Um, that absorbed. So it's, it's complicated uh, in, in the way that it works. But uh, uh, that's, you know, sort of this double displacement of nitrogen uh, gives you this little peak and then that decline. In fact, that's why I show you this one, uh, is because you get this nice, uh, you get this nice pump and then a decline to the injection condition. Okay. Um, so I want to switch to uh, a related topic. Uh, one thing that we concerns us, if you think again about those absorption isotherms that I showed you, I said, well, the nice thing about CO2, it looks like you can displace one methane and then put two and a half or three CO2s back in its place, but those CO2 actually take up space, right? Um, and you've got coal with very fine structures in them, and now you've, you've basically put in something uh, on a volumetric basis that's, that's sort of bigger, right? Because you've taken one out and put three one molecule of methane out and putting three of CO2 in its place. So what we worry about is what's going to happen to the injectivity or how easily uh, the coal lets gases flow through it. So this is what this experiment is trying to, uh, to get at. We again have gas mixtures that we flow through a coal sample. Um, there's some, you know, how you do this, there's actually, it's not just a cartoon kind of thing. You have to think about how you hold this, but it flows through. Uh, and then um, what we can do is we measure, in some sense, how permeable the coal bed is to these different gases. And that's what you see here is a measurement of permeability um, in, again, a nice metric unit of millidarcy. But what you can see is that um, here is the experimental data in points. And this is basically an eye fit to help you visualize it. Uh, so if you have nitrogen, it's quite permeable, right? And as, as you increase the fraction of CO2 in uh, the gas, it actually decreases in permeability. And if you get to pure CO2 injection, in this particular case, I wouldn't say this always occurs, but in this particular experiment, um, it's actually not very permeable to that CO2. But what we find, and again, this goes back to the story of a little bit of nitrogen helps quite a bit, is that a little bit of uh, nitrogen in this injection gas 
um, actually helps to maintain permeability in the system. So not only does it help uh, sort of get you an, an initial return on your investment in terms of enhanced methane production, but also helps to maintain your, your injectivity. Okay, so this is a way to, to, so these would be parameters you, you know, that are coming out of this work that we would encourage people if they design a sequestration project to actually consider is, you know, you don't have to inject pure CO2, what would be the best concentration uh, of an injection gas to have. Okay, um, and, and we've done this on sort of more complicated coal systems. So this is a, a photograph of intact coal samples. We've done some X-ray CAT scanning, so just like you have seen CAT scans of people's heads, you can CAT scan rocks. So uh, this is actually not a very permeable sample. What appears to be very bright here has a high CT number, which means that it's dense. So in fact, these, are, these were fractures and they've been filled up with something that has plugged them up. Um, but what's kind of neat here is you can see the hysteresis that I showed you in the permeability response. So as the pressure is increasing and we measure permeability, we get one trace of permeability. And as we decrease the pressure, uh, we get a second trace. So we can actually, in the permeability measurements, um, you know, we can actually see whether the gas is absorbing or desorbing. Um, and, and it sort of gives us some confidence that we measured the absorption parameters correctly. Okay. Um, in this particular case, the permeability loss, if you will, as you uh, go, to, go to CO2 injection is, is much less than the case that I showed before. Um, so again, it's going to be sensitive to the details. So this is maybe only a factor of about nine, okay, which, which is somewhat better. Okay. Uh, so maybe I'll skip this because we're a little on the, on the slow side. So uh, kind of summary of coal beds. I mean, yes, I think we have a cartoon understanding. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to have a graphic illustrator draw for you what, uh, what your sequestration project could look like, you could do that. Do we have a quantitative mechanistic understanding? I would say no. Um, and I would say that's partially because a lot of the models that people have use, uh, you know, this extended Langmuir model, which doesn't seem to uh, hold up when you think about mixed gases in a sequestration setting. Okay, and there's a huge upside here. Uh, the U.S. consumes, I don't know, something to one, between 25 and 30 trillion cubic feet of gas per year. Uh, there's about 1,000 TCF of coal bed methane gas in the U.S., okay? So uh, there's a tremendous resource uh, in coal bed methane. And the question is, you know, how can we, how can we get it out? And again, you know, there's significant sequestration potential, I believe. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about coal is it can actually... Um, affect some of that separation that you'd like to have of CO2 from, uh, from nitrogen or from whatever uh, your combustion gases uh, are. Significant questions, you know, how do you manage um, permeability reduction and what's the appropriate level of physical detail? I don't know if someone simulating this on a field scale is going to want to have hysteresis and all of these things that I've showed you. So we need to do some work to actually know at the larger scale beyond the lab the, what are the important physics. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll try to wrap up in a few minutes. So think a little bit about, about this setting where you'd be injecting CO2 into a saline formation. Um, and I want to show you some uh, experimental uh, results. So similar to those, some of those coal bed CT images, we can image the flow of um, really sort of uh, ideal fluids through a, uh, through a core and, uh, and, and actually see what the dynamics are. Here are images of the fraction of the core that's actually available to flow. So this is a so-called porosity. And what you see is all of the shading is quite, um, is quite uniform. So this is actually a very uh, homogeneous system. So a lot of people will say, you know, that the heterogene heterogeneities in a porous media are very important, and then they are. But in this case, this is about the most homogeneous sample you can, you can imagine. We've mapped the distribution of permeability. And again, this is all sort of a uniform shading, so it's, it's pretty homogeneous. Okay? So we'll look, hopefully, just at instabilities. So um, I would say don't worry about this. Um, but we've done, you know, in sort of collaboration with some other people, we've thought about um, 
you know, where these systems might be unstable, and it solves a very detailed um, set of equations uh, and, and takes us a, a displacement front, perturbs it, and says, do, do those perturbations grow? Um, if those grow, that's an unstable displacement. And so we've actually tried to match up a little bit prediction to, uh, to measurement, okay? Um, yeah, so uh, what these are are a measurement of the multiphase flow property of the rock. Uh, I don't maybe want to say much more, except for if you want to predict the flux of each phase, uh, you need this information to tell you uh, how permeable the porous medium is to that phase. Okay? So here we go. Here's some experimental results. What you're looking at are, uh, and again, these are ideal fluids. These are not CO2. They're ideal fluids. But you look at a different set of um, viscosity ratios. So in this case, the injected fluid, which is in blue, is um, about as viscous as the original fluid, which is red, okay? In this case, injected fluid is, about, is uh, half as viscous, and in this case, um, it's substantially less viscous. And what we see, if we look down here on the bottom, uh, and again, these are processed images from our CT, is that when we have sort of a favorable displacement, we get a nice uh, uniform displacement front. As we get to something that looks like a viscosity ratio that you might get in a, in a CO2 injection project, uh, we actually see what are referred to as fingers, because it's just like somebody's finger sticking in. This is an unstable, um, this is an unstable displacement. Uh, and you know, this, this might be good or might be bad for sequestration. I'm not saying it's bad. Uh, but it's, what it is, is is not very well described. And I'll try to make that point um, on the next slide. So we've done the companion uh, direct numerical simulation, which is DNS for this. And you here are the numerical simulations. Here are the experimental results. So again, we uh, um, are injecting. And again, you're injecting from this side. We've done a bad trick and changed the color of the injected fluid to red. So you're injecting from this side. And you're looking at uh, basically profiles along the length of the core. And again, for different cases, so different uh, velocities of how you're injecting and different viscosities of the fluids. Uh, and what you see is that, yeah, so here we kind of see like one big finger. Here we kind of see one big finger. As you go back, you see the shoulder. And then as you go back, you get into here. And in this particular case, you see one big finger here. And then you see these other little sub fingers behind. So qualitatively, there's agreement. Um, but we've done uh, sort of very um, you know, very detailed comparisons. And we look at the fraction of the pore space filled with the injected fluid versus distance. And again, for different cases, for different ratios of uh, essentially viscosity. And the experimental results are here, OK? And then the, um, the simulation results are here. So they don't match up uh, very well. So yes, qualitatively, we can describe these things. Um, you know, but in a, in, a, in a very numerical sense, we don't you know, have a, a, a direct uh, confirmation that we can describe them. And again, this doesn't lend confidence when somebody would say, well, yeah, you, you've done all these simulations to describe your sequestration project, um, but you can't match a simple, that's actually not such a simple, but you can't match a, a lab experiment with the same, you know, with this, actually with a very um, highly resolved simulation. So uh, again, um, you know, we wave our hands at this problem a lot. It's not, this isn't a new problem. Um, but, you know, the, the thing that I'm trying to tell you is that we start with physics for these unstable flows that aren't well described, and we build substantially more complicated models on top of this somewhat weak foundation. Um, so, you know, this is definitely another area where I think, you know, more could be done. Okay, so that should get me almost to the end. Okay, so... Um, you know, what have we found? You know, again, I have began with this oil and gas um, example to sort of, you know, show you that, yes, we do this today. There are projects that are driven solely by economics. That engineering can be done, okay? Uh, sort of our level of knowledge, I would say we'd have most confidence in oil and gas setting. 
uh, less confidence as you move from aquifer to coal beds than to other things that are, uh, that are somewhat farther away. Uh, these unstable displacements are not very well described by uh, state-of-the-art tools. Okay. Coals, as I said, you know, just from a research standpoint, have a lot of very interesting dynamical behavior. You, know, you have absorption, you have hysteresis in absorption. Uh, there's a lot of very interesting things that happen there. Uh, and again, they look sort of very promising if we can manage, uh, manage the flows in that setting. So future priorities, uh, and again, I, I, you know, and I showed you the spectrum sort of of GSEP stuff. I said, yeah, I'm right in the middle in the transport part of it. So I, you know, yes, my opinion is skewed. Um, so take it for what it's worth. But I think, yeah, we really need more understanding of these, these fundamental transport mechanisms and the geomechanics that happen as you move fluids through pores, right? So if you put uh, fluid into a pore and increase the pressure, it can actually uh, make the system expand or make it contract if you reduce the pressure inside the, inside the pore system, okay? Uh, and that should get me to the end. And um, this work was not done in a vacuum, so I uh, you know, thank, thank those who work here. I uh, put up on the board. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. the second. Uh, so if you think about a net-net basis, uh, if you take out a barrel of crude oil and you combust it, uh, you can put about a third of barrel of, of CO2 back in its place, right? Because you take something that's relatively dense and you add all those CO2s to it. Uh, on the other hand, most oil reservoirs are about a half empty. Um, so there's other pore space there other than just the, the, you know, what you displace. Uh, in this coal bed setting, again, it looks like it's a, you, know, you can actually be a net sequestration as long as those absorption ratios of CO2 to methane are one or greater. Uh, and then the, the aquifer setting is interesting um, because I think originally as conceived, people said, yeah, we're just going to find an aquifer and, and inject it and the water that we displace is just going to move out. Um, so in that sense, if you go with that scenario, then, then you put volume in, but you don't take any, you know, you don't take anything out. Um, so, I, I, so yeah, so the nice thing about burning methane is it produces the least CO2 of all of the, you know, of all the fossil fuels. If you're talking about sequestering coal, uh, you know, coal emissions, that's, coal produces about twice as much CO2 as the combustion of, uh, of methane. So you'd have to find more volume on a per unit of energy basis. And the first question was? Oh. oh, pressure. Do they have to maintain pressure? Um, I mean, I think the, the, so it depends on what your view is, right? So if your view is that you want to find a trap, put it in, have it accumulate on the trap, and not move, you can find those kind of traps. Because uh, that's what oil and gas reservoirs are. Um, but you might have a more broad viewpoint that says you want to put it in, and you'd like to know that, yeah, it's going to move and maybe it's going to leak, but any transport times are going to be thousands of years to get to the surface. You know, so, yeah, I might go and find one trap and then underrun and find another trap and kind of find a very tortuous path and get dispersed. And that's a possibility. Uh, and then there are, you know, there are slow, well, relatively slow chemical processes that if there's water available will actually mineralize CO2. So I think that's sort of the holy grail. You can inject CO2 and... and Converted into a mineral and then it's stuck, stuck there, and it won't, you know, no, it's no longer buoyant fluid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, well, there's a couple goals aside of sea line temperature. One is that no matter what the heat capacity of the rock is, time is on your side because it's sitting down there. But yeah. the other thought is from like PSA work and zeolites, um, when, if you were to displace nitrogen, or sorry, three CO2s in place of nitrogen, when you do that kind of thing in, you know, 
swing of uh, fairness, you get this huge thermal effect. And so right there, so well, on the from the heat of absorption. Heat of absorption, yeah. and then, but then you're thinking about desorption. That would then, in that case, would be the swing of the CO2. But the desorption is strongly affected because you're heated. The system is hot, and so the stuff uh, is uh, comes off in a different way. And yeah. similarly, think, making the transfer there to, you're not trying to swing it here. You're trying to displace the nitrogen. So on the one hand, time's on your side, and the rock, no matter what its heat capacity, it'll dip dissipate eventually, but as for what actually happens in the dynamics right there, you know, at the time that you're putting it in, in the, the CO2 can actually form almost its own phase. I just, you didn't, uh, could you comment on thermal effects of this, this transfer, you know, the CO2 in and the nitrogen out? And yeah. Do you plan to look at that? Or? So in fact, we have, so in the, so I mean, in, in sort of a macro sense, uh, the colder the coal is, the the better it is at absorbing a gas. Um, so we and so we have looked at the effect of temperature on absorption. And generally, you know, as you increase temperature, the loading, if you can, on the surface um, decreases. Um, I mean, our thought is exactly a little bit what you say. Is these are we're, we're interested in very long processes. So any you know temperature you know that's associated with the heat of absorption is going to be dissipated through the through the system. Um, so we, so for instance, in our modeling, we don't worry about the, uh, you know, the thermal equilibrium of the pore fluids with the solid. Well, it's true. It might be interesting. I don't know for sure. I don't think anybody knows, but it might be interesting yeah. to think yeah. about the effect of temperature on the CO2 nitrogen exchange or CO2 yeah. methane exchange reactions, because it might be significant. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, that's actually on my list of. I've, I've flashed it up a bit, yeah, so I'm gonna, yeah it, is, it is, it's potentially something to think about. Uh-huh. If uh, the RC is not explaining the unstable displacement, what other fluid dynamics model would you consider from the micro sense to incorporate that fluid better than it was? Um, and that's a good, well, so I would, what I guess what I would say is that that relative permeability model, where the relative permeability is a single valued function of the fluids, probably should be reconsidered um, to have a, have a better model. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, we have talked about, yeah, you would understand these on a very fine scale and then do some sort of averaging to describe what the average behavior was. Um, there's actually, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's, I wouldn't say it's a wide open area, but there's a lot of thinking needs to be done there. But that's sort of a couple of two thoughts that we've had. Yeah. I don't know, Amir, I saw him somewhere. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Did he leave? Maybe he left. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, I don't know. This, this may end up being completely wrong, but I've spent uh, a pretty bit of time uh, in, uh, seeing coal mines that have been in underground fires. And I'm wondering whether the fact that that might be changing the whole structural, you know, if one of these kind of happens unexpectedly, that, that the whole structure of the basin is looking at, like, change in certain ways. Is that something you have to take into account, or is that, you see that as being irrelevant? Uh, if a coal fire, well, so, you know, if we're injecting CO2, that if there's any chance of a combustion, that should be it, smothering, it, it, it sm it smothering that, yeah. In the larger sense, I mean, I think this is an issue, right, that you inject fluids in, and this is a reactive rock. Right. Um, I mean, you know that because it burns, right? Um, uh, so it's a reactive rock. So, I mean, that is, a, that is a real issue. You know, you put in the CO2 and the rock does swell. Um, you know, what, what does that mean in a larger sense? I'm not, you know, we haven't got to all that yet, but I, that is one of the questions, you know, what is the geomechanical behavior associated with taking the methane out and putting CO2 in that? I mean, that is a good question, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as you pump up the pressure, the increase in CO2, does the hysteresis aid, um, you know, sequestration in the sense that the pressure then decreased um, through that second? Yeah, that's that's exactly the right way. That's that that's what appears to be nice about hysteresis, right? Is that even if the pressure decreases, um, you know, it wants to stay stuck. This is actually perhaps one of the reasons why it's hard to produce methane out of a coal too. Because remember, the methane curve had hysteresis as well. So you had to, you know, to get significant um, methane off the surface, we had to really reduce the pressure a lot. So 
it could be frustrating methane production and then the primary production by just reducing pressure and actually it could be good for sequestration. And I would say not all coals have this degree of, it, it, this was a lucky choice that this one had this much hysteresis in it, but it's something to think about. So from a practical standpoint, is there a risk associated with the carbon dioxide coming back after you use it for oil gas um, enhanced recovery or coal bed methane recovery? What are the chances for the CO2 to subsequently at some later date leak out? Yeah, so, so the experience in the, oil, uh, in the oil reservoir setting, you know, it, for instance, at Rangeley, they've measured carbon dioxide at the surface. They've tried to measure carbon dioxide at the surface. And all the data that I saw supports that the CO2 is in the, you know, stayed in the reservoir, it's not seeping up. Um, you know, as we move into these other settings, like a coal bed or an aquifer, then I mean, I, I think, you know, there are other questions to ask about. Um, I wouldn't necessarily worry so much about leakage, but what are, you know, what are potential transport times to move, you know, out of the setting where you're putting it into other, into other things. And probably the biggest risk is for leakage, if you will, is not, you know, some natural process. It's that, you know, the fluid moves and it finds some well that somebody drilled, you know, and comes up the well. Um, and if that's the case, then, you know, you can find those wells and do an intervention and plug it back up. Um, so I, that's probably the biggest risk is, is just some man-made um, hazard. Mm -hmm. Are you mostly working with Wyoming? We are, yes, yeah. And other side, and other, so um, so a lot of people think about you know like anthracite in the um, in the east, right? Yeah. So um, as you move towards a higher rank coal, those differences in absorption tend to decrease. So if you get to very high rank coal, it might be one methane displaces one CO two, but the total amount of methane on the surface generally goes up. Um, yeah, there are issues, right? If you go into the, these higher ranks, then the permeability is a lot less. Um, so, I mean, there are interesting questions. Um, so on the laboratory time scale, we haven't seen anything like that because we've done those absorption curves. We've actually run around and done a loop. Um, but, you know, if you inject CO2 into a, so, you know, some coals have um, higher hydrocarbons in them. You know, inject CO2, it, it might displace the higher hydrocarbons. It's something, you know, it is some, you know, a concern to think about. Are we, uh, yeah, time. Well, give me the time to go. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.